Good morning. My name is Paul G. Summers, and I am in Jackson, Tennessee today, July the 9th, 1999, to interview my father, Judge Paul R. Summers. This interview is taking place as part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Assisting me as interviewer is my son, Isaac, who's also the grandson of the interviewee, Judge Paul R. Summers. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Judge Summers. Good morning, Judge uh, General Summers. Let's talk uh, about your family, a, f a family that I'm pretty familiar with myself since I'm part of it. Tell us about your grandparents, where they came from, where your roots are. My grandfather, as I call him Grandpa Summers, came from Statesville, North Carolina, right after the Civil War. He came down to a town called Moscow, Tennessee, about 13 miles from where I lived for many years at Somerville, Tennessee. He came with his brother, and they ran, I met an old Confederate soldier and went home with him that night. They didn't know where they were going, but uh, Grandpa Summers would not take the oath of allegiance to the United States. He had been a Civil War soldier, and uh, this captain in the Federal Army advised him to, that, it, that he wanted to, they were friends, and he wanted them to leave town, so he and his brother came to Tennessee. They didn't know exactly where they were coming, but they were on the Southern Railroad. Uh, he went to Williston and met a young lady whose father had been here for many years, been there for many years, and he married her. She was a Burnett. Uh, my daddy and three other brothers were born to that union. My uh, maternal grandfather was William C. Reeves. He came from Fed County, and he married a Lou Douglas, who, uh, after they married, they moved out north of Somerville, and they farmed. He was a, a general farmer all of his life. My daddy, he went to the University of Tennessee in 19, uh, graduated in 1909. And, and what was his name? His name was Julius B. Summers. J. B. Summers. J. B. Summers. J. Julius Benjamin Summers. Now your granddaddy's name was J. A. Summers. Julius Alexander. And he was your granddaddy was the Confederate soldier. He was a Confederate soldier. All right. My my father went to the University of Tennessee, worked his way through, got ten dollars from home in four years, and he was a roommate of Walter Chandler, uh, our former mayor in Memphis. Uh, he graduated in nineteen nine taught school to Dyersburg for one year and came down to back to Fed County to Somerville. And uh, there became, later on, superintendent of education for many years. And then after that, he became a distributor for Gulf Oil products there in Somerville. Did your, uh, did your father, J.B. Summers, get involved in politics? He did. He was in the Senate in 19, 1919. Uh, and my grandfather Summers, Jews A. Summers, was a representative in 1925. Now your your grandfather, the Confederate soldier, just so we can put it in reference, uh, he went to the House of Representatives six years after his son, your grandfather, went to the Senate. Is that right? That's exactly right. He now, was 85 years of age. Now was there anything significant about uh, either one of them about age when they went to the State House? My father's birthday was January the 16th. He could not be sworn in because Constitution prohibited that until he was 30 years of age. So he had to go to a doctor and become sick until he became 30 years of age. To go into the Senate? To go into the Senate. Now the old man, the grand, your grandfather, J.A., the Confederate soldier, when he went to the House of Representatives, how old was he when he, he got elected? 85 years of age. And every day they tell me, my father tells me, that the Nashville would send a policeman down to walk with the old gentleman from the old Carlton Hotel up to the Capitol, and they would meet him in the afternoon and walk back down 
to the old Carlton Hotel. He never missed a session. And uh, he uh, was probably the oldest person to ever be elected to the legislature, wasn't he? I'm sure he was he's right up there at tops. So I think he was one of the oldest in the, in the House, and my daddy, I know, was the youngest in the Senate. Okay. Let's talk about your let's talk about your mother, uh, Olive Beulah Summers. Uh, was she uh, did she work outside the home? She was a school teacher at one time. And uh, because my father was uh, so young when he was principal, they advised him that he needed a wife. Well, he had met this young lady who lived uh, seven miles north of Somerville, and he lived seven miles south of Somerville. They had met up at University of Tennessee in the bookstore. And since he, he, they felt like he should be a married man, he started, I guess, going with my mother, and the first thing you know, they were married. So uh, they were both young, very young people. You have any brothers or sisters? have one brother, Julius B. Summers. He's still living. He graduated from West Point in 1940. Uh, during World War II, he was in Manila, in Manila when the war broke out. And he was a dive bomber pilot. And uh, he had a very attractive war record. He sunk two cruisers in a troop ship by himself, single-handed. Japanese? Japanese. And uh, was he decorated? Decorated, I think he got six or seven silver stars. Oh, every type of decoration that you could get. He was written up in Life magazine. Tell us about uh, your immediate family. Uh, My immediate family, I, I married Peggy Myers from Somerville. I was a senior in law school at the time. I have two children, you, you're the oldest, and seven years later, I had a, another son named Philip Mark Summers. He's a... Uh, plant manager up in uh, Plymouth, Indiana for Tenneco Manufacturing Company. Got any grandchildren? I've got two. Uh, I've got one Isaac, that's your son, and then I've got little Julia. She's three years of age. And she's Mark's daughter? She's Mark's daughter. Okay. And by the way, that's the only female we've had in my family in four generations. How old are you? I'm 76. Now, you've done a lot in the, uh, in your 76. When is your birthday, by the way? May the 31st. I, I was born in 1923. 1923. Well, you've had quite a varied career. I noticed from your biography that uh, you've done a lot of things. You've been a, you've sat on just about, if not all, the courts in the state of Tennessee, uh, and you've also had a, a Gulf Oil distributorship. You've done a a lot of things. Let's start with your, uh, let's start with your childhood. Where did you go to grade school? Where did you go to high school? Where did you go to college? I was born in the house that you just sold, recently sold. It was built in 18, 1833, and I was born in that house. Uh, six years later, uh, I went to grammar school at the Somerville Elementary School. And then I went to Fayette County High School and graduated in 1941. All of this is in West Tennessee. West Tennessee, in Somerville, Tennessee, 40 miles out of Memphis. Where did you go uh, to law school? First, I was going to be an engineer. I want to be an electrical engineer. So I left high school and went to Lambeth College in 1941. I went through, took pre, all pre-engineering, all the math and the chemistry and physics and all of those subjects that I thought I would need. The next year, I transferred to the University of Tennessee, and I was going to extend my education in engineering. And on December the 4th, I joined the Enlisted Reserve Corps, and I was given a three-year deferment. Now, that lasted until February, which I got my, of the next year, two months, I got my orders to report to Miami Beach to basic training. Now, what year so my, was this? Huh? What year was this? That was 1942. Uh, while I was at, at basic training, I signed up to become a pilot and passed all of the tests that I needed to pass. 
and they sent me to Kutztown State Teachers College for two or three months, and that was called ASC, I believe it was. It was a holding pattern for uh, pre-pilots, for, uh, for the young people who were going to go into pilot training. And uh, I stayed there about three months, and then I went into pilot training, and there were four phases of pilot training. How long did you stay on active duty? Stayed on active duty until September the 30th, 1945. What kind of airplanes did you fly? I flew, I was an instructor for about a year. I was a B-17 pilot, a, a B-19. I flew a B-25. I flew almost everything that we had on the agenda, I mean, in the, in the uh, inventory. After you, uh, after you served your country on active duty during the wartime, did you continue with the education? I got off September 30th. I called the University of Tennessee and they said that I could register a little bit late. Well, I came up to Knoxville, went into my old fraternity house, got me a room, and I was going up, I was up at Henderson Street Drug, that's right up on Henderson Street. I get uh, University of Tennessee graduates, you know where Henderson Street is in Knoxville. And I ran into an old buddy of mine, Tom Pruitt. Tom Pruitt's daddy was on the Supreme Court at one time, one of my closest friends. He, he had just gotten back to, he was early released, he was a navigator. And he said, what are you going to do, Paul? And I said, Tom, uh, the calculus, I just don't remember. I, it's been three or four years since I uh, was a math student, and I guess I've got to start auditing all of those math courses. And he says, uh, I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going over to see Dean Wicker in the morning, and I want to enroll in law school. And he says, why don't you come on to law school? I said, no, I want to I, I go. I said, don't, I don't know, don't have enough pre-law, Tom. I just don't have any pre-law. At that time, you had to have so many uh, credits. Well, there were very few veterans that had come back at that time. And uh, they were needing students. So he said, I'll talk to Dean Wicker and see if all those courses you took during pilot training if we can't get credit for those. So next day we met again at Henry Street Drug and he said, Paul, said Dean Wicker says, go down there and he'll, he'll let you get into law school. So I switched from engineering to law in 15 seconds. Uh, how old were you? How old were you then? I got my wings when I was 20 and I was 23 at that time. What was it like going back to school uh, after being in the war with younger students? I'd say the GI Bill of Rights was the greatest thing that ever happened to America. What they did, I don't know whether I'd ever finished school or not if I just kept on, I don't know. But when, when I got back and all of those veterans had come back and they were seasoned, they wanted an education. Law schools filled up. All the schools just filled up. There were 20, 3,200 students at University of Tennessee when I went back, that was on the hill, including the Agriculture College. Now, <laughs> within two years, there were about eight or 9,000. It just went that fast. Did you graduate uh, from law school? Well, did you get a BS or a BA, or was that back when you, when you got we a combined? We just got an LLB. Well, after, after I finished that year at law school, then old Judge Gilreath at Cumberland University down in Lebanon, he was teaching a course called Carruthers History of the Lawsuit, which he had edited and revised. And 12 of us from University of Tennessee Law School, we transferred down for the summer. And we were going to take his special course there on the Carruthers History of the Lawsuit. was the Bible then as far as procedure. Uh, I got down to Cumberland and kind of fit in. And the next thing I knew, Tom Pruitt, I mean, no, uh, Bill Ferris came down, he was going to school, and, he, and, and, and after his wife, what was, well, she came from Jackson, and uh, Bill's wife was there. We had two women in our class, and uh, I just liked it there, and I stayed. Lloyd Tatum was one of my classmates. And so we stayed, and I graduated from uh, Cumberland in 1950, no, 1947, December 47. I went straight through. And then I passed the bar in 1948, spring of 48. Kind of digressing a little bit, you went to Lambeth, uh, uh, you went to the University of Tennessee, and then 
later um, on you went to uh, Cumberland, Cumberland and then you, went to, Cumberland. then you went to the University of Virginia for a while. The University of Virginia, uh, when, I, uh, when I was in JAG, went to the University of Virginia, went to the Southern Mississippi, I went to Memphis State. In, in any Various school courses. would accept me, I went. <laughs> okay, so now you're a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. Now you're a lawyer. Lawyer in, 19, in 1947. 1947. Were no, you? I, I was graduated in 1948. I uh, received my I passed ball. Now, when did you get married? I got married in June the 22nd in 1947. So you were still in law school? I was still in law school. What did your wife, my mother, do uh, when you were in law school? All right. She had just graduated from high school. And uh, I went home, uh, my, my father had the flu, and I went home and stayed for a little while, actually a whole quarter. And while I was there, I met this young lady uh, that would attend basketball games. And the first thing you know, we start seeing each other. And the next thing, I guess she talked me into marrying her. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was... Uh, we married. We, we 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 married in some of them, and then we went right. We went back to University of Tennessee. I mean, back to Cumberland. And when we got back to Cumberland, I realized that a senior in law school with a with a new wife that he had to have something for her to do. We didn't have anything but a little apartment. So we talked about that, and we enrolled her over there in literary school, and uh, that made things. Made everything real happy. And she became right popular there at Cumberland, didn't she? She was elected, even though she was married, she was elected football queen. <laughs> by, uh, by the way, you keep talking about Somerville. That, and tell us in relationship to uh, Memphis where Somerville is. Somerville is located on Highway 64. It's about 40 miles east of Memphis. About how big a town is Somerville? 2,500 people. And what county is it in? Fayette County. Fayette County. F -Y -E -T -T -E. Has, has the population changed much since you were a boy up until now? <laughs> it hasn't. We, we, we may have 15 new houses, but we've torn down about the same number. So uh, you really call some of your roots all your life? All my life now. I was born there, and I'm still there. Okay. Now let's just go chronologically from the time that you went to law school and graduated. Uh, what you did after graduation, which would include being called back on active duty. I worked for my father, who was in the oil business at that time, right after I passed ball. Well, I started right after I got home. And uh, then I started practicing a little law and uh, did, did very well, but I still worked for him part-time because lawyers back in those days didn't make an awful lot of money. So, uh, Do you remember your first case? I remember my first case was a land dispute down in Moscow. And I went down to look it over, and I filed some papers in Chancery, I mean, from, uh, I, I guess, a complaint in Chancery. And after negotiations, I settled that lawsuit, and I got a fee of $50, and that was a fourth as much as I made every month working full time. And I decided I better start practicing a little bit more law. So that's the first case I ever had was a land dispute. So you were practicing a little law in Somerville, running a Gulf Oil distributorship. Did you have any other business interests? Not at that time. I later on bought an insurance agency and uh, on a parts store. Did you ever have any farming interests? That's a farming area down there. I always owned a little farm and uh, did you, ever, did you ever think about becoming a farmer, or did you ever try farming? Yes, I did. I bought a farm once, and I bought me a tractor, and I bought a disc and a planter, and I went out to the farm in the afternoon, and I was trying to raise a little cotton and a little corn and a, and a few uh, soybeans. Well, my crop, my, 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 my total crop, I filled up a deep freeze with corn. I raised one bale of cotton, and I didn't get any peas. And I told the Lord that time, I said, if you won't, if you won't break me this year, I'll never mess with your land anymore, and I never have. I've owned a farm, but I collect my rent on November the 15th. 
So you just, you just going to let the Lord take care of his I'm own I'm going to let the Lord, plan. I promise the Lord I would, wouldn't mess with his ground anymore. Did you ever, did you ever consider not going back to Somerville uh, to practice or to be involved in business? No, I don't think so. I was recalled during the Korean War on uh, April the 15th. 19. 1951. Now, I was born the year before that, right? You were born, you were two years old when I was on active duty again. And I came in as a pilot. And I was recalled as a pilot. And, but they found out after I'd gotten on active duty that I was a lawyer. So Frank Bird asked that I come up to the JAG office and then I became assistant JAG officer. I still stayed on flying status, but uh, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, wa uh, Justice was enacted at that time, and I went to the first JAG school that the Air Force had down in Maxwell Field. For the benefit of those who might not know what that acronym means, what does JAG mean in the Judge Ad Advocate General. We are the lawyers of the Army, Air Force, and the Marines. Okay. So how, how long did you spend as a JAG officer recalled back during the Korean War? Uh, I, I, became, I became certified and designated by the United States Air Force about 10 months before I was discharged. And then when you got discharged, uh, you came back to Somerville again? Came back to Somerville, started practicing law again. And uh, then I bought the oil business at that time. Was there enough work for a lawyer to make a good living in Somerville at that time? Not a lot. Uh, most, most of the lawyers at that time had something else that they were doing. Just like you were doing? Yeah. Had like something else? Yeah. Uh, the sheriff, I don't remember anyone in my hometown at that time, any family that had two cars in the, in the garage. Did your, did your family have a car? We had a car. We were upper up middle class. We had a car and everybody, and most of our, all of our associates had cars, but it didn't have but one. About how many lawyers were in Somerville, say, at the time you got back from the Korean War? Three. And about how many lawyers are there now? Fifteen. That doesn't count the district attorney staff no, 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 and the no. public they, defender staff. They, they, they've got an office full. So you're back in Somerville after, after Korea, and this is about 1950, 53 or 1954, and you've got one son, and he's three years old, and I noticed your resume says that you uh, started practicing law with uh, Frank Bird. Frank Bird. Frank Bird was, was, was the JAG for the old 118th fighter group in Memphis, and after we were both discharged, he wanted to set up a Somerville office, and he he set up a Memphis office, and we 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 worked together for a good long while. Okay. And you practiced law, and also had a Gulf Oil distributorship and various businesses, until you got involved in politics, locally. Is that right? I guess I was always involved in some type of politics. I was a Keefe office campaign manager when he first ran for the Senate. And so, so and did I you was get involved? Secretary of the Election Commission, all that type of stuff. Did you get involved in politics uh, uh, because of the influence from your father or your grandfather, or or did or, or did somebody else influence you, or did you just do this on your own? I guess it's just inbred. I don't know. Well, your brother wasn't a politician. He wasn't a politician. He was a West Point graduate, military. Yeah. Uh, do you think that your, your mother or your father had more influence on, on having a disposition toward being a politician? My daddy, I'd say my father. What party were you aligned with, if any? I was a Democrat. And why were you a Democrat? Because my daddy was and my granddaddy was. Were there any Republicans? What, what did they call a Republican in rural West Tennessee at Lost. that time? Huh? Lost. Just weren't any. We had, we had to make a Republican uh, to be on the election commission, uh, we had two Democrats. They had to have uh, majority had to have two, and they had to have one. So we went out and made Mr. Melton a Republican. So we'd have uh, uh, 
uh, we could fulfill the statute. If there were two, two Democrats and one Republican on the Lake Commission. Mr. Milton wasn't anything until y'all told him he was a Republican. That's right. right. Okay. Now, 1960 was a pretty big year for you uh, because that's when you won your first contested election. Well, uh, the, the General Assembly, in its wisdom, created the General Sessions Court System in the state of Tennessee. We had been practicing in, through, in a JP course. That's all we had. What does that, that mean? Now. JP court. What does that Just mean? Just to the peace court. Okay. And that was old in the old days where you had to go heat the court. You had to heat the JP in order to, well, if, if you want to get a favorite favorite ruling. So the general, so the general. Explain assembly, what you're talking about. Huh? What are you talking about? I'm talking about a, a trial in the, before the justice of the peace. In other words, people, Justice of the Peace would try the case out in the hallway or at the filling station before they got to court. Sometime. Well, I mean, we had one when the highway patrol would make an arrest on the highway. Then he had his car right next, and he would find the people and collect the money at the same time. And this was back in the late 1950s. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the system, would you say that the system needed a little bit uh, It needed tweaking? a tremendous change. And... Uh, uh, they, they asked me if I would run, and I decided that I would, and I had no problem being elected. We had, I think I had two uh, opponents at that time. Well, uh, one of your opponents was a former sheriff there in the he county. He was a former sheriff. And uh, your other opponent was, was Justice uh, of the Peace. With the Justice of the Peace. And you beat the former sheriff and yeah. the Justice of the Peace. And you started the General Sessions Court in Fayette County. That's right. I started General Sessions Court in Fayette County. That's right. How long were you General Sessions judge? For 12 years. What was your jurisdiction? Uh, $1,500 at that time. Uh, 1129 if they signed a waiver. Uh, $50 fine. And that was just about it. Were there any district attorneys in there or public defenders? We didn't have any public defenders. If I had to have, if we needed a lawyer, I'd appoint one of the local attorneys. And uh, the district attorney general, he had one uh, assistant attorney for four counties. Was there four or five counties? Well, in five, counties, five, five counties. Five counties. Five counties. And five so you, so that that judicial district, which <laughs> consists of five counties, had a DA and one assistant. That's right. That's right. Uh, did you, were you also allowed to practice law and be General Sessions judge? I could practice law if I wanted to. Did you? But I didn't because I had other income and I just felt like it was below the dignity of the court for me to be, uh, practice, be practicing law and also be, be the General Sessions judge. I even wore a robe when I, when I went on the bench because I wanted to bring some dignity to the court. Did you have fun being General Sessions judge? I enjoyed it, and I, I think I did more good for humanity by being General Sessions than I did in any other role as a judge. There were some tough times during the early 60s uh, that you experienced there in the county, and a lot of the rural counties had these tough times. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Uh, that was Martin Luther King got killed. And we had all of the people that came down from up north and uh, wanted to tell us how to run our business. And uh, a lot of them from Cornell and Vanderbilt and so forth, they just came in and they were going, they were do-gooders and they wanted to tell us how to do it. But uh, we really didn't need any, uh, all that advice because we had the best system in the world and uh, all these local people would get along just fine. But Did you have a lot of, did you, did you, Get involved actively in trying to, uh, in trying to quell a lot of the potential disturbances. Well, if we hadn't had a sheriff that was, uh, his name is Clarence Pettit, and if he hadn't, if he hadn't had a good level, equity, equitable mind, and attitude, we could have had trouble. But he tried to do right. He was a do right sheriff. He tried to educate the people. I tried to educate the people and we ended up having no problem whatsoever. Was it was it unusual for you to as a judge to have a case where you were the judge and the prosecutor and the defense lawyer all wrapped up in one? About eighty percent of the time. It was a 
General Sessions Court at that time was truly a, a family court or a squabbles court, wasn't it? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And uh, did you did did you do much uh, ADR or mediation in the General Sessions Court? About ninety percent. About ninety percent. They they respected the court, and any any decision that we made. Uh, was respected and, and adhered to. We, we didn't have any trouble. Uh, I get, I'd, I'd have people come up, mostly mothers, and said, Judge, could I talk to you in your chambers? I want to talk to, to talk to somebody. And they'd come back and they'd have problems with the children and so forth and so on, and I'd listen to them, and I'd just nod my head and so forth and so on, and after 15 minutes, they'd say, I sure do appreciate all the advice you've given me, and I didn't say anything but just says, I'm glad to see you. I mean, that, that, that type of thing. There are so many people in the world today just want somebody to listen to them. They just want a pat on the back. That's all they need. What was the racial makeup of Fayette County at that time when you were general session? 72% black. And what was the socioeconomic makeup of the area? Uh, economically, it was the lowest per capita income county in the state of Tennessee and mostly in the Mid-South. Today, 1999, close to 2000, what is the uh, racial makeup of Fayette County? It's 50-50. And has the socioeconomic makeup improved? Tremendously, tremendously. Let's go to uh, 1972. I remember that year because I was in law school at that time, and and you had another contested race, didn't you? That was chancery race. And uh, why did you decide that you wanted to become a chancery court judge? Why? The main reason is, I guess, I felt like I had done all I could do if, in Fayette County, and. Uh, the Chantry Court covered seven counties, and I, I had a lot of people. Eleven counties. Eleven counties. Was it eleven? I've forgotten how many, but, but, because I went from ten Mississippi River all the way to Tennessee River. And I, deci I decided that I needed to, uh, that they needed some, someone to run against the present chancellor. And I found out in politics, you don't pick on a healthy chicken, you pick on a sick chicken if you want to win an election. Now, just so we won't mention this person's name, uh, out of deference to, to him, I think he's deceased now anyway, That's right. but his family. But uh, did you see the chancellor for that judicial district as, as a potential, uh, uh, as, a, as a weak opponent? He was a weak opponent. That's the reason I took him on. Did you have any anybody... Uh, uh, who encouraged you to run? In every county, in every county they encouraged me to run. John Wilder, Lieutenant Governor at the time, he encouraged me to run. You and John Wilder are friends? I guess one of the closest friends I've got. We're both getting old. But so you ran for chance for judge? I ran for chance for judge. Against an incumbent? Against an incumbent. And uh, 11 counties, I believe, you counties. had at that time. And had one chance to judge for eleven counties, and that's the job that you wanted, and you won. I won it. Now, when you became elected chancellor, uh, tell us about riding the circuit back then. Uh, I changed. I changed term. I said, we, uh, "If I am going to be the chancellor, we're going to open this court." We're going, to open, we're going to open our court to everyone. We're not going to have chance for court to call the docket twice a year. I'm going to be available and in every county every month. How were they doing it before, just to give a point of reference? All right. Uh, if the chancellor would come down twice a year, he would call the docket on Monday and he'd leave on Wednesday and you wouldn't see a chancellor again for six months. Couldn't get much business done. Couldn't get anything done. And that's the reason none of the domestic relations cases were ever filed in chancery. None of the land disputes, if they were, they were going to lay there for six, eight years before they were heard. And uh, people discussed it with him, with the system. So uh, we just opened it up to the public. 
And uh, one year, I think I tried more cases and traveled 25,000 miles. And I had so many cases that they had to give me another chancellor. So we had chance to court one and chance to court two. So by then you had the you had the two chance chancellors for that eleven counties. Yeah. Well, we we we, we lost when they we, we, when they gave me that chance. We lost Dysburg and and Ripley, not Dysburg and uh, uh, Gibson County, Trenton. But they gave me Hardeman and McNary and Hardeman. Which were close. I was close to those three counties. Well, that was probably one of the biggest districts in Tennessee. It right? was the biggest district in Tennessee. Uh, you went later went back to the legislature, and and, and I believe the uh, they had another redistricting, and they they changed the district down to nine, didn't they? Changed down to nine. I think now it's five, isn't it? Isn't it? I believe it's just five. It's five now. Five. Yeah. Uh, did you create your own schedule about when you traveled, and you traveled from county seat? to county seat the whole court? I put out a schedule for myself and mailed it to every clerk and master in my in my district. What kind of staff did you have? I had one secretary. And you had a clerk and master in each county? A clerk and master in each county. And that person was appointed by you? By, by me. For a six year term? That's right. How fast uh, could you get a case heard in the Chancery Court after you got elected? Well, I just called a docket in, in Somerville, and I was going across the street with uh, Governor Wilder, and we were going to have lunch together. And a lawyer from Memphis came out and uh, said, Judge, could I ask you a question? I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, I've got a worker's comp case I need to be tried. He says, How, when can you get to it? I said, well, complaint been filed? I said, yes. Answer's been filed? I said, yes. I said, what about one o'clock? He says, my goodness, I was expecting four months or eight months like to do in Memphis. I said, we can do it this afternoon if you want to. He says, I can't do it now. I don't have my papers. I don't have my witnesses with me. Well, you gained a reputation of, of having the Chancery Court doors open all the time, and that reputation still is talked about by lawyers in that area. That's exactly right. Did that cause uh, 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 the floodgates to open by lawyers from Memphis and other areas coming and filing complaints? After the Supreme Court ruling, I believe it says that you could file in an adjoining county. Well, it opened the floodgates for Tipton County and Fed County, and I've forgotten how many uh, non-contested divorces in Ripley. I think I granted 20 or 30 in one day. Did you have, ever have any training uh, on how to be a judge? None whatsoever then. Was it all on-the-job training, OJT? On-the-job on training and, and uh, just trying to do right and let the people come into court and have a fair hearing. Now, you, of course, are familiar with the elaborate system that we have set up today in the judiciary like the administrative office of the courts and all that. I was executive secretary at one time. They called it the administrative office of the court now. Well, when you were a chancery, did you have all that mechanism to train judges like they do today? The county would buy my legal pads. Uh, I, my office was in Brownsville in the courthouse. And uh, I don't believe we had a set of code in any courthouse that I served as chancellor. If we needed a code, uh, needed a code, code, we went to a lawyer's office in town to find it. So, needless to say, the, your, uh, you didn't have nearly the supplies or the support back then as a as a country judge or maybe even a city judge that they do today. We had no supplies, with the exception. We, I, I paid for my own code when I was champion. Now you're familiar with uh, with ADR and and mediation that's very popular today. Um, back when you were a chancellor, which was the court of equity, the keeper of the king's conscience court, did you do any mediation back then, back in the 
70s, early 70s? About 80 percent. Tell, tell us how you would, uh, when you'd go out to one of these counties like Hardin County or Tipton County, tell, me, tell us what your regular schedule was so far as getting to court and how would you facilitate mediation maybe without the lawyers even knowing what you were doing? Uh, take McNair County. We had a fine clerk and master up there. And I guess she's still there. I'm sure she is. Fairy Ruth Fair, Hunter. Fairy Ruth Hunter. When I was there, I was never late for court but twice in my whole term. What'd you do when you were late? I blew, I was going up to Huntington to, as a special judge to try to try a case that the Supreme Court had ordered me to go up there and try. And I, I blew a water pump on the truck, on the car. And I had to call for another car, and I called them and told them I was going to be an hour or so late. And the mechanic and son would brought me a car and took my car on back. I had one time. Another time, I, a uh, trucking master at Bolivar called me in, in, in Savannah and asked me if I'd stop by to hear a divorce case on my way back home. And I was tired, and I run a little bit late, and I forgot about it. And I came home, and Miss Knuckles called me. And I said, I'll be up there in 30 minutes. She said, where are you going to be in the morning? I said, I'm going to Jackson to sit for Brooks McLemore. And she said, well, why don't you run by here early and just hear it then? I said, that'd be fine. That's the only two times when I was chancellor that I was ever late. When you'd get to, say, Magnary County, for example, All right. what, what was it like when you got to court? Uh, right. We would, I'd be there at 8 o'clock. Fair Hunter would be there at 8 o'clock. Now, let me stop you. You'd be at court at, at McNary County at 8, at 8 o'clock. No, I did go to nine. All right, nine. But I would be there at eight. Just to give the the the, the viewers, the listeners, uh, an idea about the travel involved. How long would it take you to to get from your hometown of Somerville just to get to court? Fifty-two miles from from Somerville to Selma. And that wasn't the longest distance that you had to travel, was it? Oh no, Savannah's another twenty-five miles. Yeah. All right, so you get to, you get to court, say in McNary County in Selma. Uh, what would you do beginning in the morning? All right. I would always be there a little, a little bit before 8 o'clock. And Miss Ferry would have coffee and donuts and cakes there on a little table outside of her office. Well, all the lawyers would come in, and they would drink coffee, and they would eat the donuts and so forth and so on. And the first thing you know, they got to talking about the trial they're going to, the case they're going to have today. And we settled more, I mean, they settled more cases over there drinking coffee early in the morning because they were facing each other than any other way I know. And then the first thing I know, they come and say, well, Judge, we've settled this one. And that, and that was it. And then about 9 o'clock, I'd say, Miss Fair, it's time for me to robe and get on an, an open court. She said, that'd be fine. And I'd go on back to the robing room, Miss Fair and I would, and uh, I'd put on my robe. We'd come out, and then we'd open court at 9 o'clock. And then I try again, but more than likely we'd have one or two settle all. They did would have, would have settled those before. Was that your way of handling ADR? That's that's the way we handled ADR. Otherwise, we couldn't have done it. We we, we didn't have river counties. They litigate all up down the Mississippi River, on in Tennessee River. They litigate. Internal counties will negotiate. That's interesting. There's no question about it. I don't know why. But they'll, 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 river counties will litigate, internal counties will negotiate. Did you ever sit on the bench and, uh, and, and tell both parties the, the good parts and the bad parts of their case and tell them they need to go out and settle the case? Many times, many times. I'd read a complaint, and a lot of times I would bring the lawyers back into chambers and say, now, gentlemen, why did you file this lawsuit? And we'd negotiate that, and uh, 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 most of the time we'd either get a dismissal or we'd settle it right there. In the, in the, all right, let me give you an example on, on divorces. I found that out that if I if I sat there and read the complaint and listened to the plaintiff and the defendant contest the divorce case, I could pretty well determine whether or not there were grounds there. Then I would go back into the chambers and call the lawyers back. And I'd say, gentlemen, it looks like this is the way what I'm going to do, or we should do. 
And they said, let's go, I'm going to go talk to my clients. I said, all right, go back and talk to the clients. And they come back, and we settled about 80% doing that. Right before we take a break, uh, let me ask you another question. Uh, during your time as a Chancery Court judge, do you, uh, do you have any, I, I know having listened to you for many, many years, you, uh, all, many, many stories, but I know this morning we saw a friend of ours, Houston Gordon, in the library, and you related an anecdote that I, I think was pretty uh, typical of the way you handled business in your, uh, in your warm and uh, friendly way. Uh, you want to tell us uh, one or two, maybe tell us an anecdote before we uh, take a break about Chancery Court, how you used to handle court? Over oh, Tipton County, uh, every county operates different. Uh, they, they call them commissioners now, we call them magistrates years ago. And uh, most of the time, the magistrates in a, in a rural county, they had rather be a magistrate than be president of the United States. So they, in Tipton County, the whole matric system was the beer board. They didn't point a beer board. They actually beer. Well, politically, granting a beer license is not the most attractive thing, uh, the political thing to do in a, in a country county. So they would turn them down, appeal them to Chancery Court. So I was actually the beer board. And uh, I was trying this case one day, this beer hearing, and uh, the man that applied at a country store for a beer permit, there was, uh, it was toward Richardson Landing. It's three miles from a church, four miles from the river, no traffic whatsoever problem. And I said, there's no way in the world I can keep from granting this. But I looked out in, in, into the courtroom and there was a lady, and a uh, fatty large lady, and she had a bunch of people around her. And I said, wonder who that group is. So after I had all the testimony, the lawyers presented everything, I said, is there anything else that I need to hear? And this lady jumped up and she said, let's pray. So what did you do when she said, let's pray? I bowed my head like everybody else, didn't let her pray. And then when we got through, I granted to be a permit and didn't have any problem at all. Well, you find out later she was a preacher, didn't she you? She was a preacher. She was a lady preacher. And she had a congregation there. Had a congregation there. <laughs> but if I had tried to stop her from, from praying, I'd have made every newspaper in the United States, and uh, she'd have argued for another two hours. So your attitude is if somebody wants to pray, you just let them pray. I'm going to let them pray. Let's take a break. I can recall you telling me about people coming to see you on the street for advice when you were a general session judge, even when you were a chancellor. One of the things that you told me was people would come in and they would ask for a do-right warrant. You want to explain what they meant? Well, the, a lot of people would have domestic problems, and especially the women. And they, uh, they didn't think that their husband would bring the check home or doing certain things that he should do. So they would come in and say, Judge, says, I'd like for you to issue one of them do-right warrants against my husband. And I said, well, now, what do you want him to do? I just want him to do right. I said, specifically, bring your check in, and also just a general, I want him just to do right. And I said, that, that was, that's what we call a do right warrant. Would you, would you issue him one? I would, a lot of times I would have them both come in, and I, I would talk with them both and counsel with them, and uh, you'd have worked out all right. Back in general session days, I divided children up between the two, and tell them they can't speak to each other for two days. And I knew they were going to make up and, and see each other that night because you just have to use a little common sense. So what you're saying, all this business about ADR and mediation is really nothing new, is it? All right, I'll give you another example. When you grant a divorce and you're going to set child support at a certain figure because of the book, I found out that if I set that child support too high, they defended most of the men of Cincinnati, Cleveland, Chicago bound, and they don't pay anything. So you lose it all. You try to give them just enough child support that they can afford 
but you, if you overburden them, they'll leave. Did you ever put anybody in jail for not paying child support? At one time, I decided we were having so many contempt charges, I had 27 in jail at one time. And then in three days, I had none. But I visited every time I'd put a person in jail because he wouldn't pay his child support, I would be back the next day and ask him to come down and I want to talk with him again. How, if you had 20 people out there on a contempt charge for not paying child support, how would you handle those? I would just issue a metamus and sign, and, and sign the minutes and the sheriff would just lock them up. Would you pick out a case, a particular case, to have heard in front, front of the other ones just to get their attention? Always do that. How, how does that work? Uh, well, let me give you an example. They passed an act, I forgot it was when I was a general session judge. They passed an act and said that the general session judge would handle all 16 and 17 year old youngsters, people on traffic violations. Well, you know, we had another law that says that a general state judge could not handle a minor, could not, could, could not adjudicate it in a case where we had a minor. So I got worried about that, and I said, well, what we would do is when you had a traffic case, speeding and so forth, so on, then I would bring that, I, I would, would uh, have a clerk bring the mother and father and the defendant in and make them sit through my traffic court. And then I would set this case last. And then I would have the officer swear him in, swear the young man or woman in, and have them testify. And he would, the highway patrolman would say, well, he was going 82 miles an hour in such and such a uh, zone. And he said, uh, then I'd have the defendant take stand and he'd look at his mom and daddy over there because he'd already told them that the highway patrol was picking on him. And he said, no. I said, well, you're going in two miles now. Well, my speedometer might have been broken. I said, it is. I expect it was broken. I said, now, do you realize what you've done is you've tried to t tell your mother and father that, that that officer was picking on you? I guess I was. I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Now, if I find you $25 in cost, you're going to get mad at me, and Daddy's going to get mad at me. Mom's going to get mad at me, but I don't care. The Highway Patrol doesn't care because, you know, I'm paid by the state, so we don't have to worry about that. But in about six months when this record goes into Nashville and he, your Daddy's insurance rate jumps from $200 to $800, then he's going to be mad at you. And he says, it's going to be awful sad around that home. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put your name right here on a card. 30 days, I'm mean 90 days. If you don't have any other traffic offenses in 90 days, you come back into court and ask me to dismiss this uh, speeding ticket or whatever it is. And if you hadn't had another charge, then I'm going to dismiss it. <clears throat> but you've got to come back and ask me to. If you've got another speeding ticket within 90 days, I'm going to double the fine. We understand each other? Yes, sir. Fine. Mother and father just like that. When, but when I start talking about that increase in that in that insurance rate, they got they got their attention. Uh, when I was elected chancellor, I, I had many one come back. Never had one a, a repeater. But I had 35 cards in my file up there when I became chancellor. Did Never you mar one. did you marry many people? I married one last night. Do you remember Dennis Cheers? Dennis Chiz, well, he, he, uh, you appointed him and made him your drug man, is that right? That's right. That's right. Uh, Dennis Chiz is an African American. He ran, Dennis Chiz, let me clarify the record, Dennis Chiz is a, a young man that, that, that worked in the district attorney's office at, uh, running the drug task force is what you're talking about. And uh, when you were general sessions judge, uh, people liked for you to marry them, didn't they? That's right. I think I think you married Cheers and you married a bunch of people. I married an awful lot of them. I, 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 every Did, Saturday, I would marry eight, ten, twelve people. Was there anything? I'm sure nobody would uh, think that there was anything political about you marrying all these people, was it? Yeah. Uh, what I would do, since I was being paid by the county, I felt like that I should receive any money for marrying them, a fee. 
So they would, they, would, they would say, how much do I owe you, Judge? And I said, that'd be $5. So they would give me the $5, and I'd give it to the wife. I said, this is your first wedding present. And they said, isn't he a fine fellow? <laughs> so uh, there was one day we had a dressed-up man. He was completely dressed up, had a bow tie on. His wife was in white, and they were just fine. I put my robe on, and I went through the long ceremony. When I got through, he said, how much do I owe you, Judge? I said, $15. Fine. He paid me, and I gave the money back to his wife. And as I was walking out, taking my robe off, an old gentleman came up to me and says, Judge Summers, sir, you are a smart man. I said, why do you think I'm so smart? He said, you're not doing anything but buying these folks vote with their own money. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you had a good time being a general session judge, and I, I know did. you had a good time being a chancery judge. But uh, that doesn't end your career at all. You went on to do something else about 1976 or 1977. Is that right? Yep, right. Uh, Brooks Mark McLemore was the was the chancery judge in Jackson and Chester County. Now, Brooks McLemore, former Attorney General. Later on, became Attorney General, uh, and is now living here, retired in Jackson. Retired in Jackson. Right? That's right. And uh, he and I were friends. We sat by interchange many, many times. And uh, after he retired, they appointed him to the Supreme Court. Then appointed him as Executive Secretary. That's the office of. Uh, the court system there, it's Randy the, court system for the state of Tennessee. That office is now called the Administrative Office of the Court. That's right, Administrative Office of the Court. And, uh, but we called it the Executive Secretary's Office. So he was, he was in Nashville and was doing a fine job. He was a former senator. Got along well with the General Assembly. And uh, the Attorney General's position opened up and he wanted to be Attorney General. So uh, the Supreme Court would appoint him Attorney General, and he had all five votes, but they didn't want to lose him as Executive Secretary because they thought more of, of well, their Executive Secretary than they did their Attorney General because as soon as they appointed Attorney General, then they had lost him. But that Executive Secretary worked for the Supreme Court and was a handle the court system, so they thought it was important. So uh, he said, Who, how can I get you to appoint me Attorney General? <laughs> They said, if you get old Paul Summers down there to come up here and be a, a, a executive secretary, we'll appoint you. So he called me on the telephone. And I said, Brooks, I can't do that. So he said, I wish you would, Paul. So I went home and talked to Peggy, and she said, I think it would be all right as long as you came on the weekends. Now what, let me stop. What was my mother, what was Peggy doing at this time? She was teaching school okay. at that time. And uh, so... I agreed to become executive secretary, and I went up to Nashville, and he was appointed attorney general, and I served as, a, as the executive secretary of the Supreme Court. So you resigned your chancery judgeship to become executive secretary and work at the pleasure of the Tennessee Supreme Court. That's right. And did you view this as a temporary or a full-time job? Well, a temporary in the sense, I know it was a full-time job, but I mean, were you planning on staying in Nashville all the time for the rest of your career? I really didn't know, but I just, uh, well, I never have, I never had did have sort of position and ever knew what the, what the salary was. I just, when I saw a position open that I wanted, I just, if I wanted it, I thought I could be of service, I tried to get it, and most of the time I did. How long were you executive secretary? Over a year, something over a year. But I wanted, I wanted to come, go on the Court of Appeals for certain reasons. And uh, C.S. Carney, who had been the, the uh, chief judge for the Western Section, he was retiring and going to run for the president of the Constitutional Convention. Now, you were living in Nashville. I was living in Nashville at the time, came on, on the weekends. Uh, now, while you were executive secretary, were you instrumental in building any of the Supreme Court buildings? This building right here. The one, one the Supreme our, Court building here Supreme in Jackson. Court building. That's right. Well, was built while you were executive That's secretary. That's right. That's right. Well, let me ask you this question. Did you have anything to do with all of that orange furniture that used to be in this building when it first uh, built? That was picked out by Joe Henry. 
He was a very close friend of mine. And uh, I told him, I said, every time I look at it, 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 it makes me sick at the stomach. <laughs> but Joe Henry, people knowing Joe Henry, uh, it didn't make a difference whether, whether it made you sick at the stomach. He wanted to have his way. He was one of the finest judges I ever knew. But uh, he did have his way most of the time. He, he and I went to the National Guard together. Speaking about National Guard, and I certainly don't want to skip over this. During all the time frame after you came back from the Korean War, did you serve in the military in some kind of capacity? After the Korean War, I remained in reserves. I was on, and I was a JAG officer then. And uh, in about two years, I was in, back in Somerville, and I said, we don't have an armor here. Never had had a National Guard unit. So I decided that I would switch over from the Air Force to the Army and create a, and, and create a National Guard unit. So I started out with seven members of the National Guard, and in two years I had 120 or 30 members of the National Guard. And what, what was your rank? My rank at that time, I was a captain in the Air Force, but I had to go back to a, a rank of first lieutenant in the Army in order to start the National Guard unit. Did you continue your role as a citizen soldier in the National Guard for a long time? Long time, an awful long time. Uh, I went from, I went from the, uh, as company commander in Somerville. I went to Nashville as an assistant G1. What's that? That's uh, uh, intelligence. Personnel. Personnel, personnel, personnel. And I stayed there two years until uh, an opening over in JAG office opened up, and I went over there and I was promoted to major. And then uh, about two more years, the staff judge, office, judge advocate position opened up, and I was promoted to uh, lieutenant colonel, and I became the JAG, and I was JAG for the state National Guard for 15 years. What rank did you retire at when you uh terminated your military service in the National Guard? I was a colonel in reserves and a brigadier general in the National Guard. And you retired from the National Guard about what year? 70, no, 78, I believe, approximately. And during your time in the National Guard, while you were a Sessions Judge, Chancellor, Executive Secretary, throughout your career, uh, did, you, did you go to drill once a month and to to National Guard camp in the summer or at other times? Did you do I that went every, the whole every, every summer. I was troop commander one year. I had 6,000 troops under me and at Fort Stewart. Uh, they built the National Guard armory in Somerville and they named it after my daddy because uh, you, they, they thought at that time you had to be dead in order for the National Guard armory after you. Then later on, they built a brigade National Guard over in Middington and named it after me. They had to have to name it after somebody, so they just picked me. <laughs> why do you? Why did you stay in the National Guard for? I know it's like what 36 years total military 36, service. 36, 37 years. Your active duty and guard time was 36 or 37 years. Why did you stay in the National Guard? I enjoyed I enjoyed the National Guard and the fellowship and felt like that. Uh, I was doing something for my country, I guess. Uh, I've seen times when I was staff judge advocate that uh, we, we had the uh, labor dispute over at the, uh, out here at the penitentiary, and we had to bring in the Ripley and Dyersburg units, and they became uh, and they were in charge of the uh, prisoners. What does service in the National Guard offer a young man or a young woman? I'm retired, I draw a monthly check, I go to Middington or any other Air Force base or Navy base, I get my medicine, uh, I can go to the officer's club, I can go to the PA, commissary. What does it offer so far as a, a connection with other people or camaraderie? When I ran for, when I ran for chancellor, I had I don't know how many campaign managers in all of my counties because I was the National Guard member 
and I had a built-in campaign force. I just had many, many people work for me. I would send out these stickers for bumper stickers, and they'd give them out on a weekend drill, and the next day I'd go to Dyersburg, and there would be hundreds of them everywhere. So the National Guard is truly a family and a network. It's right? a family and a network. And that's the reason I guess that you're in the National Guard because you used to, you used to go to summer camp with me. Mm -hmm. And you, you used to go on weekly drill. Mark is in the National Guard. He's a helicopter pilot. But he did the same thing. Why do so many lawyers get involved in the National Guard? Fellowship, I guess. We've got... I don't know. Do you think so? You think the National Guard helped you in many ways, including politics yeah, uh, and associations. You 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 meet so many people everywhere. Let's go back to uh, going away from the military, back to your legal career. We're at the point where you've been executive secretary about a year or a year and a half, and you decided that you wanted to apply for the uh, for the job that. C.S. Carney, former Court of Appeals judge, Western Section, had when he retired. Tell us about how you got that appointment. Who was the governor? I, I told Brooks McLemore, who he was in Ashley, he was Attorney General, and uh, I was his secretary, and I said, uh, Brooks, I've got to get back on the bench and retire from the bench for certain personal reasons. And he says, well, C.S. Carney's position is going to be open. And I said, well, I, I guess I go, need to see the governor. He said, I'm, I'm going out to the uh, mansion right now in a few minutes. And he said, we're going to talk about some very strong things. Uh, Ray Blanton was the governor. And he said, uh, he went out and told uh, Ray, he said, oh, Ray told him, said, by the way, Brooks says C.S. Connor's retiring, and I've got and and I've got already had one uh, man that asked me for that position on the Court of Civil Appeal, and he says, uh, and Brooks said, by the way, Governor said I've got a candidate for that job. He says, who is your candidate? He said Paul Summers. He says Paul's a good friend of mine, and says, but he got a better job than than the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeal judge. He said, Governor. He said, that's just where so many people make a mistake. He said, because, uh, he said, we really don't know always what people want. And he said, I just talked to Paul last night, and he wants that position. He said, well, he says, you know, uh, he's he right close to me, and he says he got to go through the Pentecost Nominated Committee and so forth, so on, be one of three, and he says, you know what I'm going to do if he if he is. So that that's how I got back on the court of appeal. So I'm on the court of appeal. So uh, is, is there a lesson out of that uh, experience? Yeah. Is, it, is it a lesson that you can share with the, the viewers, particularly those who might want to be involved in politics or might want another job or might want something in life? What's the lesson to be learned from that? A personal lesson that comes from you. You, you told me you wanted to be Attorney General a long time ago. I told you I thought you should try for the Supreme Court. And you said, I don't want on the Supreme Court. I want to be Attorney General. You on a, you on a, you, you're Attorney General now. But you didn't even try to be a candidate for the Supreme Court. Well, but the point, the point I want to make you is You wanted to be Attorney General. You've got to ask somebody, right? You've got to ask somebody. You've got to ask somebody and let it be known what you want. Otherwise, people will just won't give you a lot of times what you really would desire. Do you see a lot of lawyers who want to get involved in politics who uh, who think that uh, because they are qualified and, and are very popular that uh, that alone will get them ahead in politics and they never get out off of, uh, they never get away from home plate? Very, very few times Unless you do something, you won't get ahead. Things don't happen. You make things happen. Explain that. That means you want to be Attorney General. You made sure that you were going to be appointed Attorney General. You made things happen. Well, let's get off of me and get back on it. All right, me? I, I, I want to be on the Court of Appeals because a person reading, 
Things didn't happen, I made things happen. Okay. In other words, you've got to ask people. You've got to ask. Ask and it shall be given most of the time. You got on the Court of Appeals. All right. You came back to West Tennessee. That's right. And uh, you had an office in Somerville for a period of time, but you mainly had an office here in this building, in the Supreme Court building, which you, which you were instrumental in building. Tell us about your days on the Court of Appeal, who you served with, and uh, generally what your life was like as an appellate judge here in Jackson. Tomlin, Hewitt Tomlin, Hiles, Mathern, Nairn, that's over a period of time. We had some fine judges. Uh, when I first served, it was Mathern and Nairn and Summers. And then we had another judge that later on we had a fourth judge and he died at heart of, a of a heart attack. I can't recall him right now, but he's a fine, fine person. And the first opinion I wrote, I sent it to uh, Judge Nairn. And about three days, I came back, that was a dissent. So I called him up on the telephone. I said, Charlie, why did you send me a dissent? He said, well, that's the way Judge Carney always did it. I said, no. I said, well, you, I said, you got a different judge now. I said, you got old Paul R. Let me call you and let's discuss this thing because I could be wrong. I have been once or twice in my life. And I said, I don't mind changing. That's the last time I ever had a dissent come back from any of my judges. Right? We always called and went over because we took pride in our work. I didn't want to put out something that was erroneous or uh, was going to be put in the book and somebody laugh at me 40 years from now and say, what did that old fool write that for? When you were on the Court of Appeals, did you still get involved in politics? And I will refer you to Brooks McLemore when you and he went to Nashville to help the judges out a little bit. Right. The judges at the, judges at the Judicial Conference decided that we need some help up there. So uh, my judges on the Western Section decided that they would, I would just work kind of half, or take a half load, then I would spend about half my time up there and trying to get our retirement and our salary straightened out. And uh, Brooks when you and I, say help, help where? In Nashville. In Nashville, where? In with, with the legislature. Okay. They were the ones that they, they are the ones that give, and they are the ones that take it away. So did you do that? We got through. We have. We 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 ended up. We were. We had a real fine bill. And it's still operating today with a cost of living in that bill. Is the bill that you and, and Brooks McLemore lobbied for the uh, the bill that the uh, that has the cost of living increase in it? Still in there, and the legislature was satisfied with it, the governors have been satisfied with it, and the judges are satisfied with it. Even though you were an active judge in Nashville with Brooks McLemore, who at that time was he retired. Re was retired. Were you registered as a lobbyist? I was registered as a lobbyist. And Brooks was registered as a lobbyist. And do some of those judges still comment about that pay raise you got for them? They still appreciate it. What percentage pay raise did you and Brooks get for the judges? Or, or because of the wisdom of the legislature they passed at your recommendation? Well, I'll give you an example. When uh, they had the... Uh, African American Conference in Memphis. I was invited down there. I think H.T. Uh, Lockett was the president at that time. And uh, he was so pleased with it that they made me the judge of the year that the uh, black conference did. Now, at that time, uh, I was talking with a judge from New York and one from Alaska. And they asked me what the trial judges made at that the next year. And I told them what it was, and we were making just a little bit more than New York and Alaska, which are pilot states as far as high ju judicial salaries. Were they kind of surprised? I'm not going to tell you what one of them said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, how long were you on the Court of Appeals? About five, six years. And then, and then you retired. Now, I'm going to go back to some of your time. Retired. But I'd like to know, because uh, I... I know that you told me when I asked you when you retired at age, what, 57, 58? 59. 59. 
I ask you why you wanted to retire at what is a pretty young age for a judge. And what did you tell me and what have you told everybody? Why why'd you retire before you were 60 as a judge? I mean, you had a, you had a bird nest on the ground. Why did you want to quit? I was taking up space for some other young judge and I wanted some, somebody else to have the opportunity to be a judge like I did. I guess that's what you're referring to. Well, I specifically, and I don't want to mention any names, but you know some of these old lawyers that you used to refer to that, that, that that's exactly tell, tell, me, tell me what, what you're talking about. I, I, I think I, what I told you, I said one of my older friends, and he comes to town, and they look at him and says, why don't that old man stay at home? He's got soup all over his tie. He looks, uh, uh, it, it not his shoes are untied and so forth and so on. And I wanted to, to retire at the time where people remember me as a fairly nice looking judge. And I just didn't want to remember me as being an old worn out man that was in everybody's way. I believe you told me, quote, I want to leave when everybody says, oh, I hate to see That's Judge right. Summers leave, isn't it a shame that he's quitting the bench? I don't want to get to the point when they say, I wonder when old Judge Summers is going to leave. That's exactly what I said. Yeah. Are you glad you retired? No question, never regretted one day. I've come back and sat with the court many times since you, then. I mean, you haven't gone and, and you haven't gone and sat in an easy chair and and, and, and drinking mint juleps and resting and stuff, you still you still are still active even to this day on the bench, aren't you? I sat last year on six or eight uh, workers' comp cases, maybe 10, I forgot. Have you ever sat with me uh, on the Court of Criminal Appeals? You and I sat on the Court of Criminal Appeals together two or three times, and I believe Research will show that it's the only time a father and son ever sat together on any court. And they can't find it where, where that any father and son ever sat together on any court outside of Tennessee. And because of the pecking order and the seniority system, who was the presiding judge? On you were. I was on the, I was on the lower end of the totem pole. <laughs> and who got to assign the cases? You got to assign the cases. Uh, and and did, did we always agree? No, you dissented on one case, I know, maybe two. Let's go back generally through your career. And I know I'm, I may be even catching you off guard here, but I, I bet you'll be able to come up with some names. Have you met some outstanding lawyers in your career as a lawyer and as a judge? Uh... I saw one today, Houston Gordon, Shep Tate. Tell us where Bill these people. Berman, he, tell, tell, tell us where these people are from. Houston right. Gordon is from Covington. From, from huh? Covington. Shep Tate from Memphis. There is no final lawyer. Leo Berman and he and his daddy both. They were just fine. Young Leo was a fine lawyer. Uh, It's hard to think about. Tom Pruitt did a fine lawyer. Oh, there's so many. B.B. Gullett out of Nashville. What are some of the qualities that make a good lawyer? Compassionate, completely ethical, attention to duty, and take care of the client. What are some of the pitfalls lawyers can get into when they're dealing with their client? What, what, is the, what are some of the major pitfalls that they have that cause them more trouble with their client? Procrastination. Procrastination, I think, is the greatest pitfall. Uh, I've seen so many young lawyers today that spend more time explaining to their client why they hadn't gotten their case settled or tried if they would go ahead and work, they wouldn't have to make those excuses. What about communication with their client? Very few. They all well, doctors have the same problem. Uh, they they don't they 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 can't they don't communicate with the, with the uh, client. 
Do, do they get into a lot of trouble when they don't? Awful lot of trouble. Awful lot of trouble. If, if a doctor would go in immediately after an operation and would explain to the person that he let the sponge, sew the sponge up in their stomach, explain to them what happened and it was how sorry he was, there would be less malpractice lawsuits. What are good qualities of a judge? Honesty, a person of integrity, a person with compassion, a person that wants to be a good citizen, and humanitarian. Have you seen much change in technology in the judicial administration over the years? Tremendous amount. I sat on the first with the Supreme Court when they had the first uh, 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 when it televised the first time. And I, I thought then, I said, what we're trying to do is make a bunch of movie stars. And I just don't believe a lawyer can be as fine a lawyer as he should be with that television camera right in his face. Do you still feel like that? I feel like that today. You don't think they ought to have cameras in the courtroom? I wouldn't have them. Do you think it helps the public some to know about the system, or do you think it, if it, even if it does help the public, then the disadvantages outweigh the advantages? No, I don't think that I don't think that uh, they outweigh the advantages, but I think that. Uh, well, I give an example. I've told uh, all of my clerks, when, when people come here to the courtroom, to the courthouse, and ask for information, I said, that's the first case most of them have ever, have ever had. They know nothing about the system, and for goodness sake, be a little compassionate and explain to them what the system is about, and ask them if it's something that you can help them with, because they don't know. They're, they're, they're just, they just know that that's a big old courthouse over there. Uh, 99% of the people of Fayette County don't know, know what the trustee does. They don't know what they, they know what the register of deeds do, they, but they don't know what goes on in a, in a courthouse. You know judges from the Supreme Court all the way down to city court. Does the average citizen know who's on the appellate court or which type of judge are they closest to? General Sessions judge. That is the people's judge. Do you think that a judge, if you had to choose between a judge who's extremely smart or a judge who has a lot of common sense but you couldn't have both, which one would you choose? I'd rather have 10 to 1, one that had a good common sense because the smarts are in that book if you, if you read it. Does that include trial court as well as the appellate court? Same thing, same thing. What are some of the major challenges that you see that face the judicial system today? Can the, can the uh, older judges and lawyers keep up with the new technology? Uh, as you know, I had two rooms of books at one time. Now you've got it all in a laptop computer. It's hard for me to conceive that all of that information is right there in that laptop computer. Uh, but that's the way it is. Uh, this, 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 this system is going to work regardless. The system is not broke. It'll work. And it, and it, and it continues to work because people with good common sense are going to still be in charge of the, of the system, I think. How does a lawyer who came from a small town in rural West Tennessee that was one of the poorest per capita towns and counties attract enough attention and support to get to the positions that you have attained?
it's just I think it's honesty. I've always tried to be. I've always I've always tried to be friendly. But I've got the rep, 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 reputation. If you ask me to tell you the truth, I'm going to tell you the truth. If it takes the bark off the tree, I won't lie to you. And I think that's the secret. And I think you can ask any lawyer that I, that ever practiced in my court, and they'll say the same thing. Well, do you think it's important? What are some of the qualities that you think it's important to, for someone, say a younger lawyer, for example, if he or she wants to uh, get involved in the judiciary, what are some of the things that you might tell them that they should do? It doesn't come just from being smart or being on the law review. It takes a little bit more than that, doesn't it? A lot more than that. What do you have to do? You've got to develop your perspective of life and realize that we are not all born in the same mold that you've got IQs from 70 to 180. Now, sometimes the 70 and 80 IQs are more compassionate than the high IQs. Let me give you an example. When I was in the Air Force, they wouldn't take a pilot if he had an IQ of over 145. But they wouldn't take, they wouldn't take one if he had one below 110. They wanted good, solid, young, at that time men, to fly their airplanes. But they didn't want an egghead, 175, 180, flying because they would not make good pilots. Now, you've already told us that you were a Democrat. Yes, sir. Have you had a good relationship with Republicans in, all, in the bran other branches of government through your legal, political, and judicial career? No question about it. I, I, uh, Lamar Alexander pointed me on the court of a, uh, State Board of Education. Uh, I have no better friend than Don Sunquist. He was my representative. But just because I'm a Democrat doesn't necessarily mean that I don't like Don and I don't like, like Alexander. Is there anything else you'd like to say about politics that you might be able to give uh, some advice to? some of your viewers who want to be involved in politics, particularly uh, the viewers who are lawyers who want to get involved in politics, some basic fundamental rules. Let's follow the rules of the lobbyist in Nashville. A lobbyist, as long as he's honest and will tell the truth, he'll get along with the legislature. But the minute they catch him in a lie, he's lost his reputation and he might as well give up his job as a lobbyist. Same way with the practice of law, and I think the same way with being a judge. Now, we started, when I was executive secretary, we created these three meetings a year. Uh, all the, all the uh, judges would come, all the state paid judges would come. Well, the lectures are awful, all, all real fine. The, 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 the school programs that they had were good. But the judges learned more at night talking among each other than they learned from the educational processes. Uh, one judge can talk to another and say, you're just crazy as dickens. Well, I've been doing it that way for two years, and he finds out that he's been doing it wrong. And another judge will tell him. See, uh, judge is a funny, uh, funny group of individuals. We don't have any privates. They're all generals. The only difference, some have, have remained humble enough where they can meet with their fellow man. We, we have a few that get the black robe fever and that is not good as far as being a judge because they think that uh, God takes a vacation and they take over. What is the black robe fever? It's just when a judge, when a judge gets so egotistical that he wants to be placed up on that pinnacle where everybody will look up at him and will kind of worship him rather than being a good judicial member and will render decisions. Right and wrong. 
when I, when I became a judge, you gave me some advice about uh, if you take a man or a woman uh, who's, uh, who's about 75% of a, of a jerk, if you want to make sure they're 100%, what do you need to do? Put a black robe on them. Will it come out every time? Every time, every time, 100%. I mean, it just—it has a way of just oozing just, just, out. It, 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 I've never known one that was a jerk when he was elected judge, put on that robe that he didn't become, get the black robe fever. That includes the city court all the way to the Supreme all the court. way. Makes no difference. Holy than thou. Now you've served as a judge in in the year two thousand. You've served as a judge either active or retired for forty years, uh, with a brief stint as executive uh, secretary. Of all of these jobs that you've you, that you've had, General Sessions, Chancery, Executive Secretary, Court of Appeals, you've sat specially on the Supreme Court, right? You've sat Many specially times. on every court, is that right? right? Which job did you enjoy the most? I enjoyed being General Sessions judge more than any other position I ever had. I didn't ask you this, but when you became General Sessions judge in 1960 in Fayette County, what was your salary? $5,500. $5,500 a month? A year. A year. And, and you enjoyed that, that job more than any of the rest of them. Why? I was close to the people. I did more good f for the people. And I, I had all the respect of the people. And I don't know, I just enjoyed it. Same way my wife told me she'd been assistant superintendent, was offered the, a, a superintendent's position one time. But she says, I'm sorry I ever left the first and second grade. Let's talk about, you brought up my mother, your wife. Tell us what her, how her career, how her career progressed from the time that she was elected uh, homecoming queen at Cumberland. I guess it was Cumberland College at that time, now Cumberland University. How did her career progress? As I, as I said earlier, uh, after I was a senior in law school and she enrolled over in literary school, we came home and in about a year or two, I, she worked for Chickasaw Electric for a while, but then she decided she wanted to go back to college. So she and Zilla Hawkins and two or three other ladies, they drove back and forth to Memphis State. Zilla Hawkins is from some of them. From some of them. And she finally got a Bachelor of Arts degree. Then she started teaching. Uh, but she wouldn't teach while you were young. And she started teaching. And then along came Mark. And so she quit again until Mark got up to grammar school age. Then uh, after that, she taught school. Then she was taught teaching in Germantown and was offered a uh, stipend. And she went back to Old Miss and uh, got her master's. Uh, you, know, you were a senior in, in high school and you drove back and forth 80 miles a day to Germantown and came back. And uh, she was down at Old Miss and I'd have to have supper cooked by the time you got in in the afternoon. And, uh, She'd come in on Wednesday, and Mark, and Mark was going to school down at Ole Miss, and then she'd come in on the weekends. And uh, I think that was the best, the best lesson that you ever learned, is that you had to utilize your time because you ended up driving 80 miles a day for four years, and you ended up valedictorian. So you had to utilize your time. After, after uh, I got out of high school, did my mother continue to teach? Yeah. And uh, after she left the Germantown, the Shelby County school system, where did she go from there? She came back to Fed County, went to Fed, Fed, uh, Fed Academy. And after there? Then she went back, she was a supervisor for the Fed County Board of Education. And where did, what position did she retire from? She retired about the same time you retired, didn't she? Yeah, retired same, just the same time. And what position did she retire from? She was assistant superintendent. So she went from being a, a school teacher in, in Shelby County, and then she when, went from a, a 12th grade married woman yeah. <laughs> to a assistant superintendent. All right. And uh, while we're talking about my mother, as it relates to your career, do you think that the spouse of a judge, whether it be a, a woman or a man, 
has to act in a certain manner? Do they have to do things differently than, say, the spouse of some other professional or some other blue-collar worker? Not, not a bit of difference. Uh, we grew up, if you remember, we had our conferences at the table after we'd eaten dinner or breakfast. And we kept, we had a, a set of conference encyclopedias right by the, by the little dinner table. We had a, a dictionary there. And if we'd ask questions, or y'all, your boys would ask questions, we'd look it up right there in the conference encyclopedia. We'd look up, the, use that dictionary religiously. And uh, you learned to research when you were young. I remember one day when you were about four or five years old, Peggy says, how are we going to teach him to be respectful? I said, Peggy, from this day on, I'm going to say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, to you, and I want you to say, yes, sir, and no, sir, to me. And both my boys today will say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, whether they're younger or older than they are. Did When you were a judge, did you ever talk to my mother about cases and seek her advice and... I never went in your mother's into your mother's school room, and she never came into my courtroom. Which of your jobs that you've held do you think that you did the most good or had the greatest impact on Tennesseans, on citizens, on people generally? I think I started a movement when I was executive secretary that had a tremendous influence on the changes in the judiciary. Describe that movement. Well, it was we started we started out. I put a, a I put flags behind every in every courthouse behind in, uh, behind the in the courtroom. I put flags all over the Supreme Court here. I put the big signs uh, in every courtroom. Every lawyer's office had a flag, Tennessee flag, and a Supreme Court, I mean, an American flag behind their office. Every judge. Every judge, every one of them. And that was one thing. We put, we, I got appropriations from the legislature. We put codes, codes in, every, in every courthouse. We put the code in every judge's office. What about judicial education? We, we, crea we, we created the first judicial, well, at that time, we, were sending, we started sending people to Reno. And, and after that, what, what's Reno? What's what's Reno is our school out of Reno, Nevada, where we train ju the judiciary all over the United States. Did they have much education for judges when you first, when you became executive secretary? Didn't have any much, very little. How would you how would you dole out the uh, the some of the education benefits to the judges. Would you just write them a letter and say anybody who wants to volunteer, or would you kind of dole it out to judges that probably either needed it or deserved it? The, we knew in Nashville, the weak judges, we knew the ones that were strong, and we did it both ways. Uh, if we thought that a, if a judge needed some extra education, then we would try to get the funding so that we could send them out. Uh, I remember I had a, a judge in Nashville. He came over and he wanted to go to Reno. And I said, uh, how long have you been on the bench? He says, about six months. I said, you're not ready to go. He says, why? I said, because you get out there and they'll start teaching you about this inherent power and all of those things that uh, we've been reading about. And you come back in here and you'll you're just mess up this uh, court system, try to mess it all up. And I said, now, wait, wait after a year, then I'll send you out to the court. He said, I understand. Do you think that, uh, do you think that judges have an easier time being executive secretary or administrative officer of the court or regulating and advising judges than non-judges do? No question about it. Brooks McNamara was a judge. Uh, he could talk to any judge on the same level. I was a judge. I could talk to judges on my level. Because as I said, 
They are, they are all generals. They don't have any. We don't have any privates. So and if you've you, got, say, somebody who's a lawyer or a non-lawyer, is it difficult, even though that person has the position, does it, is it difficult for a, someone who has not been a judge to look at a judge and tell him or her, I think that you are m making a mistake or down the wrong track? What lawyer is going to tell a judge that he's making a mistake down the track when they're going to practice in his court? It takes another judge to tell him that. Yeah. You uh -huh. never had any problem with telling them that? Never had a problem. I remember one judge told me, uh, who, who was at that time a recently elected judge from Shelby County, that, that uh, when you had one of the judicial conferences, when you were executive secretary, he came up and introduced himself as, well, I'm judge so-and-so, and what did you tell him? you remember that? No, I really don't. Well, he told me you came up and, and said, I'm Judge, uh, and I won't mention his name, I'm Judge so-and-so, and you looked at him, and you were the executive secretary, and this was his first conference, and, and I think you said something to the effect, no, you're John or whatever his first name was. I said, let me tell you what, we, we're full of judges around here. Being a judge ain't no big deal, yeah. so you're, you're, you're whatever your first name is. <laughs> That's right. And he said, I always remember that. And, he, and you kind of put him in his place right off. But uh, so you think that you think that although you like to be in a general sessions judge the best, so far as your personal working environment, you think that you made a significant impact as executive secretary? I hope I did. I, I think I did. Uh, you know, the two motivating factors of life, basically, I think, of sex and egotism. And we're all egotistical to a large extent. And I think the reason I wanted to maybe rise higher was because I'm a little bit egotistical and that's just human nature, isn't it? That's right. I'm not gonna get involved into the sex part of it. I really don't know how to fit it <laughs> in, but I think I better leave that for another discussion. Well, that, that, that's... I might let Isaac ask you those questions. Right. Or something, but, <laughs> but uh, well, Kind of toward the end of our discussion here, uh, do you think that the, the, the judicial conference in Tennessee now, say on a scale of one to ten, do you think, uh, and, and com I want you to compare the judicial system in Tennessee today versus what it was back when you were a chancery court judge on a scale of one to ten. Is one no improvement? Let's say one was the way the system was when you were a chancery judge back in the 1970s, and then 10 is a utopian situation. I'd say it's up around six. It's come a long way? It's come a long way, it's come a long way. But because a lot of people have worked hard to make it come a long way. You know, have you, you've gone to, you still go to the judicial conference, oh, yeah, don't yeah. you? Have you noticed, uh, some of these judges, even some of them are, who are, are even on active duty that are your age, are working with computers and involved in some of the more ad, what is considered advanced technology, at least for them. Uh, does that surprise you? It surprises me, but I'm glad it's happening. Do you think judges are more conscientious now than they were back in the 70s? Yes. Yes, I do. Compare the judicial conferences, you know, when the judges go three times a year. Compare the judicial conferences and be candid. Don't mention anybody's name, but be candid. How did, how did the judicial conferences uh, change back from the 70s to the way they are today? In, 19, in 1970, it was considered to be a kind of a vac paid vacation for most of the judges. They had they went to have a good time. However, I'm not going I'm not going to discredit that because when they were playing, they may have been criticizing another judge, and it may be it may be a learning process. Today, uh, we've got some of the finest people that that in Nashville that create our educational program now. And they do a tremendous job. I think so. What do you think about the uh, the role of the Tennessee Supreme Court 
when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, supervising the judiciary? Do you think they need to be active or passive? Well, who said walk lightly but carry a big stick? Who said that? I can't Somebody remember. One time. I think I think they need to. Uh, they don't need to meddle. They don't need to meddle into the affairs of the judiciary, but they need to have a big stick so that they can use it if they have to. Do you think we have a professional judiciary today, particularly compared to the way it was in the '60s and '70s? I'm pleased with it. Did, However, there should be some changes, but I'm pleased with it. Did you have many women? judges back in the 1970s. Had one, I believe. And it, what can you say about the rise of the number of women on the bench and how, how do you compare the job that they are doing to the men? I see no difference. Uh, I went through a transition, as I said, at, at, at University of Tennessee we had one woman going to law school, one lady, and then we had two uh, at Cumberland, I believe, maybe three. Uh, when 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 uh, the African Americans and the ladies started coming into court, I never really. It never made any difference to me. They were just lawyers, and they were just arguing and taking care of business. And I never really, in, in my own mind, never thought that whether they were women or African Americans or what they were. And I think that's what today I believe most of your judges are trying to. Uh, think that way? I don't know. I don't. I don't think. It's... Do you see any distinction in the judicial conference among the judges when they view, say, African Americans, women, or any other or any other group of people? Do you see any distinction? At I don't all? see any distinction at all. I don't see. And I think that one of the greatest appointments lately has been Connie Clark to the position in Nashville. I now, think Connie Clark is one of the finest people, and she will do a tremendous job, and she's got a hard job. Now, Connie Clark has been recently appointed to the position of what? She is uh, administrative officer of the courts. And Connie Clark was formerly a circuit judge in she was Williamson circuit judge County, in Franklin, Tennessee. Well, Williamson County and the other That's surrounding right. counties, and, and had been a, uh, a elected twice as that circuit judge. Well. And the last few questions that I want to ask you before we conclude our, our discussion. How would you like to be remembered in the legal community and in the judicial community if you had a choice? I'd just like to have a plaque somewhere that said he, he was a uh, he was honest, he was a person of integrity, and he said it like it was. Is there any advice that you would like to give a young lawyer as he or she progresses on their legal career that do you think would have been invaluable had you been given that advice? Well, the advantage today is a young lawyer, like a young doctor, they can make untold amount of money. But when they get to the top, they're not going to stay there. They may get there with a lot of bull, but if they, if they don't have something, they're not going to stay there. If they don't have something that's basic and something that's a foundation. That's right. Something basic and a foundation. Is there anything else that you would like to add to our discussion that you think would be helpful to the viewers that I haven't asked you or we haven't discussed? No, but I remember three years ago that John Milton, the blind poet, said, Within one's own mind, he finds a heaven in hell or a hell in heaven. And I think that's right. I think the mental attitude makes a lot of difference as far as young lawyers are concerned. Uh, I remember <laughs> I was reading a case one day, and uh, I saw one of my 
fellow, fellow judges wrote, words are like chameleons. They often take on the, environment, the color of their environment. And I thought, I said, that was a fine statement. I didn't know he had it in him. And then about two weeks later, I read that was written by Mr. Learned Hand. <laughs> <laughs> so judges will plagiarize at times. Well, I want to tell you, uh, Dad, Judge Summers, General Summers, uh, what a pleasure it's been for me to be your interviewer. And I want to thank Barry Bernstein and the Tennessee Bar Foundation for giving me this opportunity. I also would like to, uh, to compliment our videographer, Marcus, and I would also like to compliment Isaac, who has set in on this two-plus-hour uh, interview uh, for uh, being such a good boy, and we appreciate Isaac. I also would like to thank, thank Sue Roberts, our friend, our family friend, and the clerk here in the Supreme Court building in West Tennessee for all of her accommodations. Thank you very much, and this will conclude our interview.